Well, I know on Maui, one of the biggest challenges, we do not have a, an emergency shelter. Mm. I mean, we have, a, we have uh, uh, First Cathedral um, has a, a limited number of beds um, that they do on an emergency basis. We have, you know, uh, uh, shelters, but you have to go in, you have to be willing to be dry. In, in other words, you can't have any, sure. have a substance abuse or alcohol issue problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's no consumption, those kinds of things. But we have this one slice of that pie where we do have people that are not, um, you know, ready to make that choice, mm -hmm. but need a safe place to go. Correct. And uh, I've been trying for years to try to get something like that to happen on Maui, and we just haven't been able to get that momentum to doing mm -hmm. it. Um, I'd like to show a, a quick video of some of the Oahu facilities for the homeless. If we could show that video for the audience, that would be great. Hello, my name is Shannon Hayes. I work for U.S. Vets and I am the site director at the Wai'anae Civic Center. At the Wai'anae Civic Center, we provide services for families, children, couples, and adults. Our facility is able to house up to 300 individuals. We have 117 units available for the families to live in. Our shelter provides programs which assist parents, children, and adults, singles and couples, back to housing and independent living, job placement, and ability to be productive citizens who give back to their community. Aloha, my name is Rita Martin. I'm the Community Relations Coordinator here at the Wai'anae Civic Center. The Civic Center opened in March 2007. Uh, the Hawaiian name is Paiolu Kaiolu, and it means lift of encouragement as the journey begins. One of the features that we have here at the center is we're a one-stop shop. When people come to us, they would have been referred by an agency who have pre-screened them for any mental health issues or substance abuse issues that would have been beyond what we can offer. For those of them who have um, qualified, they're able to come to our center. Um, they will be tested for any drug use. And the beauty of our program is if they are dirty because of the drug use or alcohol use, we will take them in if they agree to go for drug treatment. Other things that we do um, for case management, we have qualified case managers who work with our clients one-on-one -on -one, and they come up with a service plan and part of that service plan is things that they have to work on while they're here. Um, we also have classes. Every month we have up to 20 classes that they can come and pick and choose what they'd like to do. Classes such as um, parenting, anger management, domestic violence. Um, we have a couple of dance classes and they absolutely love those classes. Well, their main goals here is to um, find a place to live so that they can be self-sufficient with their family. And the other important thing is if they're able, they're physically able to find employment. And uh, we have our case managers that help with that. I think it's important for everyone here to understand and also the viewers that homelessness is increasing in our state. And, um, and as it was previously discussed, there's a lot of reasons for that. But um, I think more substantively, we really need to come up. We can talk about, well, it's, it's job creation and that. But really, I think, gentlemen, that the real issue is coming down to cost of living. And what we're seeing here at the legislature uh, this session is exa exactly that. We're, we're seeing that in terms of these bills that are being passed that increase fees and, t and um, taxes and registration for vehicles and all of those issues are all being pushed ahead, which in then increases the cost of living. Uh, for our residents here and then when is the straw that breaks the camel's back and then pushes a person into the shelter you folks have any thoughts about that right well I, th I think it's a delicate balance I mean we certainly need a lot of these services but on the other hand you're right that uh, they can can push families out of right out of their homes and so uh, you know I think the, I hope the, the legislatures will will uh, keep that in mind as they uh, as look look at these bills and not just at, at the, the needs of, of the programs that are running. Um, 
I think it's important too to realize that uh, we uh, we can engage with each other, we can help each other. There are a lot of resources that we can share with each other. Uh, I think of the tsunami in Japan and the, the worldwide uh, response to that. And, uh, you know, people are doing whatever they can to help with that. I think we just need to uh, let people know, as you're doing, that uh, there are people among us who are homeless, there are brothers and sisters, and we can do something for them, with them, uh, get to know them. And it's not, it's not a Catholic issue, it's not it's a not Lutheran a issue, no. it, it's, it's a, a human issue. Um, and I think that no matter where you worship or if you don't worship at all, there's still ways that you can step up and help people. Daryl, what are your thoughts? It's a shared problem with a shared responsibility with a shared solution. In the, <clears throat> I don't envy the legislators to have to make the tough decisions of what to fund, what not to fund, who gets what, how do you divide the pie when there's so little. And we're obviously a nationwide and in the state in an economic crisis where a lot of things are, are in danger of being cut. And of course, as social services, we're always looking at what can we do to preserve the funding, not for ourselves, but to give the services that we need to the individuals that are there. They obviously, we have to access the private sector. The private sector has a responsibility to the community as well. And it's our job to have the conversation. Their investment may not be the same as our investment, and that's okay. Their right. investment can be, I'm running my business, I want to make sure that the street's clear here. Right. What can I do to make sure that I'm engaging with them to say, I want to help you with that, but I also need to get this done. So it's a shared responsibility. The government has to give the funding. We have to have these conversations such as you're doing. And it's exactly correct, the bishop, the education. You know, everyone can play a part where there's even having a conversation over dinner with your family talking about breaking the stigmas of what people believe homeless are. I think you touched on a very important point. You know, when I was growing up, folks, um, you know, I would hear adults around me talking uh, about, you know, they'd see a homeless person on the street and they say, oh, that guy's a bum. He just should go out and get a job, you know. And, and you, hear, you hear those kinds of things growing up in the old days. There was that, that, that uh, I don't know, baggage that was uh, immediately attached to somebody who, who uh, was homeless. That, that mm -hmm. you know, everybody has a choice. Everybody can get a job. Everybody. But the, as, we're, as I grew up and as I became a police officer and I looked at the complex issues mm -hmm. about what we're looking at in terms of the reasons why, whether it be domestic violence, mm -hmm. whether it be substance abuse, whether it be lack of employment or underemployment. Sure. Um, uh, I, I have met, uh, during my career, I've met, um, you know, I've seen fam a family of four living in a car mm -hmm. and the parents both worked. Right. And that was an issue. I think it's important for us to get to know who the homeless are. Many of our youth groups go and work in the shelters and uh, it is an eye-opener to them because they see these are normal people, mm -hmm. these are families, these are uh, people just like us and we could be there ourselves if it, you know, if we're one paycheck away from that. And I think that if we can uh, uh, break the myth that all homeless are uh, mentally ill or have drug problems, uh, then I think we will be more open to helping them. Now, of course, those who are mentally ill and have drug problems also need to be cared for, but perhaps their care is, is a little more specialized. But uh, I think we can all um, benefit ourselves from reaching out to others. And uh, I've never heard uh, anybody go to, a, to feed the homeless or to, to work with them and say, uh, that they themselves had not benefited a great deal. And Absolutely. so I think that's a, an important thing that uh, we need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Dar? Well, I totally agree. You know, the understanding that we all play a part in this culture and hum humanity and that we have to give choices. It's not my job to judge. It's not my job to tell people what they need to do or shouldn't do. It's our opportunity to give opportunities to people. There's a lot of social detriments of why people are determinants that why people are homeless. And while there's some people that can make the choice, our job is to offer up choices. So if an individual is choosing, at least he knows where he can go. And sometimes that takes more than one time of talking to somebody. If somebody has built up their defense because they've been on the street, which is very hard work to be homeless, you have to guard your stuff, you have to be defensive. And I come to you one day and say, hey, let's come on in. I'm quite sure you're gonna be a little wary of me at first until I engage with you. And that's the skill that the social workers bring. 
So the reality is that we all realize that we play a role in this, and we have to understand that this is our brothers and sisters that are living out there, and we need to offer choices. That's our job. Our job is not to necessarily say what they need to do, should do, or make people do, and do understand that some people may not choose to access that, right. and they have to take responsibility for that as well. It's a responsibility from the person all the way up the food chain mm -hmm. to all the people that are doing what they're doing in this uh, government officials, all the way from President Obama who wants to end homelessness, all the way down to the individual who is living in the street. I don't personally feel that we'll ever be able to end homelessness, I, I, nor will we ever be able to eliminate poor or people that are hungry. I think that we as people have to strive for that in our lives to try to work towards that goal, mm -hmm. even though it may not be reachable, but it's our duty, I think, as, as citizens uh, of this country, of being citizens of the world, really, uh, to take the responsibility of that. You know, we should do all we can to making sure that everybody has fresh water, everybody mm -hmm. has at least a meal a day, everybody has a safe place to go to sleep. Uh, where, where, where there may be not a, a situation where we can provide a home for every person mm -hmm. or a room for every person, but at least we provide dignity for people. And I think that's really the key, right? Dignity? Yes. And I think uh, it's, it's very important that we keep the ideal, that we keep that goal of, of eliminating it, uh, but that in, in doing that, we not be overwhelmed by the reality. Because you're right, we're probably never going to achieve that ideal, but the temptation then is to give up on it. Right. And to say, well, not really much I can do. Yes. There is much we can do, and that we are doing, and we need to keep doing, so that uh, uh, you know, little by little, we we move toward reaching that goal. I mean, when I hear the end homelessness, I agree. I don't know if it's ever ending, but what I when I hear when I hear that, I means that to me that when somebody does experience that, there's some things they have some choices to do, because we've been proven that if you shorten that time frame, when a person becomes homeless it's much easier to get them back into housing. It's even easier if we prevent it. Yes. <laughs> if somebody's in their house, they're having trouble paying their rent, we need to learn how to do more prevention. And by doing that, we will slowly reduce the number as veterans went from 250,000 five years ago to now it's 100,000. And we want to end it in five years and we're already a year and a half in that. It's because of permanent housing and prevention money that has helped do that. Well, the good news is that on the neighbor islands, at least the homelessness has actually been decreasing. Um, although we've seen the increase in Honolulu. I don't know if we've shown that slide or not uh, that shows the trend is starting to go down at least on the neighbor islands. Uh, I think that, um, you know, that's, that's good news. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they're not just coming to Oahu and relocating here mm -hmm. for services. But um, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for being on today. Um, thank it's you. been a real pleasure to sit here and chat with you about this important uh, subject matter. and. Uh, hopefully, maybe uh, in future shows, you folks will be willing to come back and maybe give yes, us sir. some updates on the, the work that you're doing. Uh, I think the work that you're both doing is just fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, that's another show for us. Uh, if you would like to write in, I'd love to hear your comments. That's repfontaine at cap capital.hawaii.gov. Repfontaine at capital.hawaii.gov. Name in town, name in town, if you wish to opine about this segment. Uh, we look forward to uh, si uh, hearing from you, and uh, we'll see you uh, again on The Fontaine Factor. Thank you for watching.